I think the uh, music has ended, which is our cue uh, to begin. So I want to welcome everyone here, uh, especially the students, for, for coming out on such a beautiful Friday afternoon uh, and uh, be a part of this celebration. Uh, I'm Michael Reedy. I am a professor in the Department of History and Philosophy. I teach a course on Darwinian Revolution. I thank for the students uh, coming from that. Uh, they'll know uh, how much I appreciate uh, the university when they bring together and combine science and the humanities and the arts. And it's one of the great parts of uh, the Stibbets um, Wilson Awards, which we're celebrating uh, today in several venues. And just on a personal note, um, these have been going on for a while and for years, and one of the highlights, I think, of my uh, career here was sitting on a bus to Yellowstone with E.O. Wilson, getting off the bus and then looking closely at ants, uh, his specialty, and him telling us all about them um, as we were sitting in the middle of this wilderness in a closed, at the time, Yellowstone uh, National Park. And I remember those moments uh, when I'm uh, here uh, today uh, for these awards. We similarly uh, have awardees um, who embody uh, that Wilson-esque, I think, um, uh, passion for knowledge and passion for bringing the arts, uh, humanities, and sciences together. And it's all really due to and made possible by, uh, by donors um, who have supported this. Uh, that includes Honors College and the College of Letters and Science. It includes uh, Zoot. It includes uh, the Nels and Liz uh, Lutweiler Foundation. Uh, the President, Wadet Cruzado. Uh, and the Montana, Montana Chamber of Commerce. Those are the ones that make these sorts of things uh, possible. Um, but it has its inception uh, and its real uh, being uh, because of this incredible thing that we have here in Bozeman, which is the Computer and Robotics Museum. So I want to bring forward, forward the co-founder uh, of that museum, uh, Barbara Karameta. Hello, my name is Barbara Karameta and I'm the uh, co-founder and current uh, board president of the American Computer and Robotics Museum. And I would like to take this opportunity to just uh, say a few words about the museum, its history and its mission, which is to inspire visitors of all ages to explore the past and imagine the future through thought-provoking exhibits and innovative storytelling. Uh, the museum has been operating for 32 years now, and it was a brainchild of my late husband, George Karamagiev. Uh, he was a man of very many different talents, uh, but um, the true description of George was his voracious appetite for learning. He, uh, he had also a tremendous knack for explaining and communicating complex issues in science and technology uh, to anyone, so anyone could understand that. Uh, in the museum, he used this gift uh, to exhibit and showcase uh, the historical aspects of all the artifacts that are on display. Uh, George, George's uh, goal as an educator was to celebrate the joy of learning. And the visitor's comments on TripAdvisor and Google definitely attest to that. Um, I hope uh, that most of you in the audience who have seen the museum will agree with that. And those of you who have not yet had the pleasure to see it will make it to the museum soon. 
Um, the museum has a very satisfying relationship with Montana State University and had it for very, very many years. And recently we also extended and extended that partnership by offering a free admission to the museum to the students and faculty. So please take that opportunity. So see you in the museum soon and now I would like to return to the purpose of this gathering. I'm so very much looking to the question and answer session that will follow me. Thank you so much. It's an amazing museum. Uh, it's free to students, at least students in the College of Letters and Science and the College of Engineering and maybe other colleges, but certainly those. Uh, it, it, e. Wilson called it sort of inch for inch the best museum in the world. And certainly for the history of computing and robotics, um, it is uh, one of the top museums in the world. My personal favorite is the copy of New Newton's Principia. So if you're gonna steal anything from that museum, <laughs> that's, what to, that's what to take. Uh, Google how much that costs on um, eBay. Uh, in today's in today's prices, uh, so let's begin. I'm going to ask our, our uh, two uh, honorees to come and take a seat uh, front and center. Um, we have two uh, amazing guests today. Uh, the first is Paula Apsell. Uh, Paula is a science communicator, um, a, a film producer. She got her start at WGBH uh, in Boston. Um, so, worked her way up from basically uh, daily television, uh, and in 1975, uh, she joined WGBH's uh, NOVA, uh, uh, science documentary series. And uh, again, moving her way up in 1985, a decade later, she was tasked to take over the reins of NOVA, uh, where she served as the senior executive producer and director uh, for the unit for 33 years, helping to transform it into a powerhouse of science communication. Well, I'm especially thankful for that because my parents limited uh, our television and we were allowed uh, Mutual of Omaha's United Kingdom um, and then Love Boat and then Nova. Uh, and so I, I have a lot of experience in it. Um, it's become the television show uh, for science, highly respected uh, by both filmmakers and scientists alike. Uh, personally, uh, Paula has received numerous awards, including the 2018 Lifetime Achievement Emmy of the National Academy of Television, Arts, and Sciences, the first science journalist to be honored. Uh, she's also a member of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, no small feat, again, uh, for a science journalist. Paula, thank you for joining us today. Our second uh, uh, honoree is uh, Craig Venter. Craig is a genomic researcher, um, the, one of the top genomic researchers. Uh, he's founder, he uh, started uh, his career, actually, um, out of uh, the Navy uh, as a corpsman in Vietnam um, and uh, got his PhD from UC uh, San Diego and then an appointment as a professor at SUNY Buffalo, the State University of New York at Buffalo. Uh, and then he moved into the National Institute of Health campuses uh, where much of his research uh, was undertaken. He is the founder and uh, co-founder and director, CEO of the Craig Venter Institute, which is the nonprofit wing of his uh, research organization where he works uh, with hundreds uh, of scientists um, in the field of synthetic and environmental genomic research. Uh, he's also um, the co-founder of Synthetic Genomics, um, which I'm hopefully he will talk about at some length uh, today. Uh, his awards, likewise, are too numerous, actually, to go through, um, but uh, if you Google him, you'll see uh, that he's credited, in part, 
uh, for uh, creating the first creator of synthetic life. And I would love to know also what that means as we move forward. Craig, thank you so much for coming. <laughs>
about this thing that was really the focus and the center of the whole lives was such a gift to me and I was like, this is the best thing. I want to just keep doing this until I die. And um, well, I haven't died yet, but I'm still doing it. So that's pretty much, I'm sorry I went on at such length. It's actually a good story. And uh, as you know, we sequenced the Bangladesh strain of smallpox that you covered in your video. That was the last, first and last strain of smallpox ever sequenced. So, really? Um, my career started less gloriously. Um, I was a horrible student. I hated school. Uh, I left uh, Northern California when I was 17 to take up a surfing career in 1964. In 1965, I got drafted to go to Vietnam. Um, and, you know, like so many people, that changed my history as well as others. Uh, I was in the medical corps and just love medicine, love learning. Um, as a young man, I was training interns at residence on doing spinal taps. And, other complicated techniques. I did major surgery uh, at age 20 um, and uh, had to go back to school because uh, I'm such a lousy student. So I started a community college in Northern California then transferred to UC San Diego. Um, and I got the shortest PhD in history, uh, three years uh, from starting and went into research by inter being introduced at a university like this, University of California, San Diego, to research as an undergraduate. And I actually published my first paper as a junior and just thought science was so exciting. I stopped plans of going into medicine and went into research. And uh, research is hard, you know, it's, uh, but like Paul, like uh, people that have been successful, uh, you know, good luck helps and being in the right place helps. Um, I was at the right place and the right time in history with the right idea um, to first in 1995 sequence the first genome in history. And then with that technique, uh, go on um, a few years later to sequence the first human genome. Now, looking around, all that happened before most of you were born, uh, and, and so it probably really seemed like ancient history, but you'd still be pretty happy today if you got one of the calls um, from a company uh, that I thought were fake calls offering me $300 million to sequence the human genome, and I kept hanging up on them. <laughs> Uh, but it, it turns out they were uh, sincere, and uh, um, in 2000, we, after a year after starting, announced the first human genome sequence in the White House. And uh, uh, genomics has sort of changed all of biology, and it's changed my life. And trying to understand genomes, we decided uh, the only way to understand one was to build one from scratch. Uh, and that's how we got into synthetic biology and uh, uh, spent 10 years building uh, by synthetically writing every letter of the genetic code, a genome um, that got booted up in 2010. And that was just reproducing a genome that was known, just showing that we could chemically make it and then boot it up but then we spent the next decade designing a new one uh, that uh, I think took us 10 times as long as we imagined. And it took 10 times as long because a third of the genes in every cell, including this minimal cell, were of unknown function. So as much as you're told by your biology professors and others, you know, that all biology is known, um, one of my most famous quotes is, we don't know shit about biology. Uh, and it's still true today. And so we're still trying to understand the function of a 
many of the genes in this minimal cell, the smallest genome of any living cell, but it also showed that we can design cells and uh, design life from scratch. So um, that's a rough history. Craig, you can keep the microphone because I have a question for you, a follow-up on that. I know that there have been some roadblocks in your work and especially um, uh, complications with the Human Genome Project itself um, and your techniques uh, as, uh, as, as we try to uh, sequence the genome. Uh, at the time, it looked like you had lost those battles. Today, it looks like you won them. Uh, I wonder if you want to talk about those. Uh, we don't think of science and human genome projects and things uh, behind the scenes as, uh, as battling. Uh, do, you, do you want to comment on those sort of roadblocks? Well, I don't think they're unique to science. I think that the thing that's a surprise is, you know, science is like any other human endeavor. Um, if you come up with something new, there's resistance to it. Um, because so much of science, the currency is not dollars, it's generally credit and fame. And so that makes the stakes a lot higher. Um, as they say at battles at, at universities, they're um, the most intense battles over so little. Um, but humans are very emotional, aggressive, possessive people that uh, anybody in any field that's come up with something really radically new has met with lots of resistance. And fortunately, I had good backers that believed in what we were doing, uh, that we could take on the entire U.S. government um, and fight against a $5 billion budget. Um, I've gotten, you know, a number of awards and met kings and princes, and I was in, uh, um, in Abu Dhabi, and I had a meeting with the crown prince in his tent, and he said, I just have one question for you. I said, okay. Uh -huh. He goes, how did you defeat the U.S. government? <laughs> so, everybody looks at these challenges uh, very differently, but it's whether you're making a film or writing a book or whatever you're doing, um, first and foremost, you have to believe in yourself. Uh, Paula called it chutzpah, but it's just she believed in herself that she could do it, and uh, I believed in my abilities and my team's ability. Thank you, Craig. And maybe to, to bleed in, Paula, to a question uh, from the, one of the students online is sort of the opposite. It's, it's great to hear Craig talk about the subject, subjective human nature of a supposedly objective uh, scientific endeavor. The opposite for you on what is an obviously uh, filmmaking and producing a subjective endeavor. How do you um, guard against it, or in the words of the student, with your main challenge presenting science when the film's personal filter, filmmaker's personal filter, may potentially be construed to skew or bias the presentation? Uh, I mean, a certain amount of bias is inevitable because the filmmaker is telling a story and the story has to come out of that person's head and out of that person's heart. But that's what executive producers are for. And I have to say that, um, you know, that that is a source of a lot of conflict when a producer sees a story a certain way and the executive producer, my job is to say, yes, but what is the relationship between the way you see this story and the story you want to tell and the story that exists in reality? Because the fact is, is that, as you said, Craig, science is a human endeavor. And most of the time, the scientists that we were telling stories about at NOVA were still alive. And I was always very conscious that we were trying to tell their story, 
not our interpretation of their story. Now, to say that, as I go back to the beginning, it's inevitable when you are telling a story that your point of view is going to color that. But there has to be a good fit between that story and the real story. That is the story the scientists want to tell. Sometimes it's very difficult. I think some of Craig's stories were very difficult to tell. And he may be pissed off at the way we told them still. I can't even remember way back when. And I certainly know that some scientists um, were not happy with the way we told our stories. I have to say, I think that was a minority of scientists. But when you had um, a lot of competition, a lot of bad feeling within the story itself, um, that makes it more difficult. That makes it much more difficult to tell. And that is because scientists are people and they have emotions. and. Um, so that often entered into it. But I would say that we really, really, really made an effort to do such extensive research that it became apparent what the real story was. And, you know, of course, it was a first draft. And in 10 years and 20 years, the story and many of the stories that we told, Human Genome product, Project, Artificial Intelligence, wherever, wherever we were is going to change. But that was a story that we saw at the time. And we tried as hard as we could to do enough research so that it was really based on reality. Thank you. I have one more question for uh, the panelists, and then I want to open it up uh, to uh, the students in the audience. We've covered past accomplishments uh, and some of the roadblocks. Let's turn to the present and even the future. Uh, what are you working on now that you're most exciting, excited about? Uh, and what, what do you plan on working on um, for uh, the rest of your careers? <laughs> and I want to hear about the Global Ocean Project, Craig. Well, I spent the summer finishing my third book, and it's a book about uh, sailing 55,000 miles around the globe uh, in my sailboat uh, doing science. So it's probably the project that I did that probably pissed off more people than anything else because I found a way to sail my boat around the world doing great new discovery science. And uh, I remember some of my uh, colleagues in the Department of Energy talked about that they had to go to acid mines while I was uh, going to sunny beaches. And, uh, um, but from that expedition, we discovered more species by several orders of magnitude than existed in all of science. Uh, it's because people thought there were very few microbes in the ocean. Because the only way microbes had been discovered in the past was by uh, something that they could isolate and grow in culture. And uh, that's a pretty limited view of the world. And so we decided to use DNA sequencing as our new window on the world and just filter 200 liters of seawater, collecting all the microbes on filters, uh, then sequencing all the DNA. And the computer algorithms could separate these into uh, the new uh, tens of millions of varieties of new organisms. So we looked in some of the places that that Darwin looked and discovered major principles of evolution by looking at macro life. Uh, we looked at the life he couldn't see, uh, but that life makes up the majority of life on this planet. Uh, was here long before us and will be here long after we live. Uh, and, you know, um, in my book, Life at the Speed of Light, I talk about the likelihood 
of discovering microbial life on Mars and other planets. Uh, we exchange 100 kilograms of material uh, each year between Earth and Mars, and that's before we started sending spaceships there. Uh, so you can't take a, a shovel full of soil on this planet without having a little bit of Martian soil in it and, and vice versa. So microbes will be the universal part of life. Um, they provide 40% of the oxygen we breathe. And uh, um, so it's a, an exciting adventure book of all the things we encountered uh, politically and adventure-wise sailing around the world. Um, at the same time, the Venture Institute has been doing a lot of uh, work on SARS virus and uh, uh, new approaches to dealing with it and uh, applying synthetic biology as a, as a tool, still trying to understand the minimal cell uh, that we built. But also the other area has been extending to try and understand genomics by measuring the complex physical traits that everybody has and linking those back to the genome. And in doing this, we discovered that in people who think they're totally healthy, um, that about 50% of them have some major underlying disease that they're completely unaware of. So 5% of everybody over 50 had a major tumor that they didn't know about. 1% of the whole population has a brain aneurysm that are usually discovered when somebody has a massive bleed and uh, almost everybody knows somebody that's died from an aneurysm. So it changes discovery science, it turns medicine sort of upside down, that combination of predictions from the genome and doing preventative tests uh, most diseases uh, can be eliminated. Craig, that's interesting to me because, of course, Darwin began his career with a net on the side of a boat collecting gelatinous material and ended up making major advances in biology. You started with major advances in biology and ended up with a net on the side of a boat. It sounds like a Nova program. Uh, well, actually, uh, unfortunately, it was a Discovery Channel program. We, we wanted it to be a NOVA program. But, uh, Paula, I would love to hear what you're doing, and especially um, on a new discipline I learned only last night, uh, having dinner with you, which is Holocaust archaeology. Right. So, uh, yeah, well, I retired from NOVA in 2019, and quite after 35 years leading the series and almost 10 years as a production assistant and then associate producer and a producer, um, I didn't have the vaguest idea of what I was going to do. And to be very honest, it was a pretty hard landing. It was really very, you know, hard because telling stories is really my passion in life. And here I was, the only story I had to tell was my own. <laughs> and I wasn't at all clear what that story was. Well, you know, but circumstance intervenes. In 2016, I had gone to Lithuania to direct a program called Holocaust Escape Tunnel. I worked with a group of geoarchaeologists who were using different kinds of remote sensing te technologies. And they discovered a, um, a tunnel that had been dug in a place called Ponar, where the Germans and uh, Lithuanians had killed 100,000 people, most of them Jews, but not all, also communists, gay people, anyone that the Nazis didn't like. And um, that was a huge, a huge experience for me because I always used to talk about the moment of discovery, that you wanted our cameras there for that moment, but it actually never happened to me in all the shows that I had directed. And here, using a technology called ERT, electrical resistivity tomography, they did various slices and could really document that this tunnel, which had only been rumored to exist, had existed. And of 80 people who dug it, and all during the day, they were burning bodies that the 
Germans wanted burn, burned because they wanted to destroy the evidence of the killing that they had done. And then they would stay up all night and dig this tunnel and they were shackled and they used candles and they dug with spoons. So it was really amazing. Those 12 people went out to the forest and they later fought with the partisans against the Nazis. And uh, I worked, as I said, with a group of geoarchaeologists and one of them really was the pioneer in Holocaust archaeology, which is, goes to different concentration camps, different places where the Nazis had killed people, primarily Jews, and tried to get to find evidence of, in a lot of these places, there are large fields where people are still buried underneath who were killed by the Germans as they were trying to escape. And none of these places have ever been marked, and he wanted to mark them. So he wrote a book, The Archaeology of the Holocaust, and he needed medical treatment because he was a, had been a leukemia victim and a, had a bone marrow transplant, which he had survived for 20 years and, went and had excavated more than um, 60 Holocaust sites. We were sitting at my kitchen table drinking, drinking coffee and talking about Jewish resistance, and basically he said to me, you know, we really need to make a film on this. And I thought about it, and then I mentioned it to my husband, Sheldon, and he said, yeah, you really have to do this. And I'm like, ooh, you know, me? I, I have worked for an institution all my life. No matter whether I, what I did, whether it was good, bad, or indifferent, I got a paycheck. I, wasn't, I didn't think that I was cut out to be an independent producer. But times change, and you know, I'm a person, I'm in love with a good story. And these stories of Jewish resistance, most of them have never been told about, we all know about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, but there were uprisings in over a thousand ghettos, and no one knows about those heroes. There were uprisings in death camps, and no one knows about them. 25,000 Jews fought in the forest, and they preserved the forest the Nazis were actually afraid to go into the forest. These are fantastic stories, and they come down to really the courage of people who fought. It's one thing to fight if you think you have a fighting chance of winning. It's another thing to fight even though you know that you're a powerless person with maybe 10 pistols, and you're not going to win, but you're doing it for your honor and for the honor of your people. And that moved me tremendously. And as I started to do research into this, and I'm a, I'm a research girl, I, you know, I get on that telephone and I read books and I just can't stop till I feel I have the essence of the story in my hand. And once that happened, so nothing stood between me and making this except about $1.3 million, which I then had to raise. I raised a lot of money for NOVA, but I had a big institution behind me. And here it was, just kind of little me who alone um, as a, an independent. So I set up a company. I petitioned the IRS to be a 501c3 public charity. Um, people were also moved by the story. And uh, lo and behold, I now have a film called Resistance, They Fought Back. And uh, it will be done in about a month and a half. It's kind of a miracle. And um, I'm just loving it. Will I make more films? It'll take a long time to roll out this film. Independent documentaries, much different from a TV documentary. They go to festivals. They go to theaters and they kind of go all over, they go to museums, they go to educational institutions like this one. So it's kind of a very different thing. So best thing is, you know, at my advanced old age, I'm learning every single solitary day and I get to do what I love best, which is to tell stories and stories especially that are meaningful to me. I want to open it up for students who may have questions. We have two microphones uh, at the sides, please. Um, if you want to, there we go. State your name and, and where you're, what you're doing in school. Hey, uh, I'm David. Uh, I'm studying physics. Um, and 
So I, have an, I, I picked up physics recently uh, from biomedical engineering because I have an incessant need to know the universe and to use that knowledge to help people. The only reason that I'm staying in university instead of grabbing textbooks and learning at the fast pace I'd much rather prefer is so that investors will take me seriously. I want to ask for your input on the optimal route or an op optimized route uh, to building great companies that can help change the world for the better. If you could go back in time to your college days filled with the passion, drive, and capacity to build companies that could help change the world through technological advancement, and if you were willing to give every second of your life in pursuit of these ambitions, what route would you take to achieve these goals as fast and efficiently as possible? I, I would start by sequencing the human genome and then uh, uh, going out and trying to apply that to make uh, uh, the world better. So you either have to just be, uh, you have to go to business school and be a businessman or you have to have a passion that's based on something you've done or want to do. And, you know, a company's not always the best place to do it. Uh, so I, I would start with your passion and then see where that takes you. I, I never make money, so you don't want to ask me. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of famous for doing things pro bono, so, yeah. <laughs> but, I, but I have to agree with Craig. You will be a happy person if you are doing what you love. And if you're doing what you love and doing it well, it will turn into something. You can't always follow directions and pave your path. Do what you love, try to get a job that puts you in a good place to do what you love, and don't expect you probably won't be the boss the first day. But you will be eventually if you are passionate and if you are simply the hardest worker. That's my two cents. Thank you. Hello, I'm Anya. I'm a biochemistry major here. So I was homeschooled. I never really grew up watching the Nova shows because we didn't have a TV, electronics, nothing. But I still grew up like around that influence of people I know who watched it. So I know it got through to a lot of people. And so in the last couple years with the uh, kind of world situation in terms of science and health, I have been here learning about science and then watching my family go down this weird informational rabbit hole of no one actually, like everyone's got different science, including my mother, who is a surgeon. So in your opinion, what is a better way that we could communicate science to the current population? Because obviously something has gone quite wrong. If you know, even the medical professionals in my family have lost faith in the establishment of science, whatever that means. Great question. No, Thank you. you you raise a very complex history that's really fucking up our entire country. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, fact-based decision making used to be taught in schools, uh, and evidence-based decision making was sort of the driving force and the success of most things in this country. Um, just because there's major political factions now that try to ignore that and make up their own set of facts, it, it's something that the pressures on institutions like this one and every other one around the country uh, to step up more than ever to stress evidence-based decision-making. You know, that there are, you know, science is about discovering the truth about the world. And sometimes that truth gets rewritten as we discover more things, um, but it's different than just having a political agenda. Um, 
I don't know how to combat it other than realizing that virtually everybody has to speak out and institutions have to fight the lack of education that's going on around them. You know, places like this exist in a vacuum to some extent right now, and that has to change. You know, I, I think that that old uh, adage that evil prevails when good people do nothing. So I, I just, I just think, you know, we have, you know, I this this isn't a new phenomenon. In fact, if you go back into history, you really, you really see that anti-science. Um, philosophies have um, have sometimes they're dominant, sometimes they fade into the background, but they have existed for hundreds, maybe thousands of years. Even when we were at Nova, we made a program about evolution. I would get blasted, and oftentimes the people that were blasting me in either letters or emails that were pages long and extremely erudite, these are not stupid people, um, would, um, they were just wrong-headed. Um, now I think a lot of the people are stupid. I think we can, kind of, we can sort of agree, agree on that. But those, those of us who study and who believe and who have faith in this evidence-based process. And science is an important path to truth. Um, have to maintain that and have to not be intimidated by the loud, shrill voices that are all around us. Because I'm old enough to say, this too shall pass. I, I believe this, I have to believe it or I think I would go into such a depression, I wouldn't know what to do with myself. This, there have just been eras, eras where there have been just terrible ideas prevailing. And it is so wrong-headed, it cannot continue forever. At least, I hope not. But people like you who are studying the real deal, we have to be brave and say it and do our thing and not be dissuaded by people who want to intimidate us because that is their MO. Thank you. But I have to say, it's easy to say that when you're 75 years old and probably a lot of the important things that I'll do in my life are done and my favorite thing is babysitting for my grandchildren. So. Um, I think that young people like you, you have, a, you, have a, you have a tough road ahead of you, but you're fortunate, you're at this beautiful school, you're being educated in the right things, be brave, and stand up for what you know is right. Hello, uh, I'm Cole. I'm a Camp Glen Sharing student, and I wanted to ask, what was the single most difficult episode or stage of your project, or even your single most difficult day in your respective careers? You want to start? I have to think about it. I had so many. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I loved the problems that came to me creatively. I, I thought even when a program was going wrong, there was always a way to fix it. And I, it's just like sitting down doing a math program problem. You know, you, if you keep working away at it, you will figure it out. And I enjoyed the process enough. I mean, I'm not going to say I was never depressed that I had given wrong directions or that maybe I chose to do a topic that didn't really pan out and now we were kind of stuck with, <laughs> I won't say what we were stuck <laughs> with, but, um, but, um, but so um, 
There were very tough stories to do, and I think of the series um, Fabric of the Cosmos that we made with Brian Greene about physics, about time, space, the conflict between, um, between uh, quantum mechanics and classical mechanics. I mean, these are really hard topics, and they're very expensive to do because you need a lot of and we were way over budget and way over time, and yet, and I was getting yelled at all the time. And it, yes, it was very scary. But, um, you know, most things turn out okay. My biggest fights were just to kind of keep the management people like, away from me, let me finish my work, I know we can do this. Because I know we will do it, because we always did it before. But it doesn't help me when you keep yelling at me. <laughs> so I guess, you know, people are always difficult to deal with. <laughs> I, I, I have so many incidents, I, you know, I can't settle in on what, what was the most important other than uh, when we were uh, working on sequencing the human genome, it was a daily battle, and uh, um, we were doing technology that nobody ever tried before. Um, we had to build one of the largest computers, and I'd never built a computer, let alone a supercomputer. Um, we had to write uh, half a million lines of new computer code to try an algorithm that nobody tried before. You know, um, it gets down to sort of the earlier questions and, and what Barbara was saying. It was, it was about believing in yourself uh, at every stage. Um, because people will doubt you, they'll criticize you, and um, but it's a dangerous balance. You know, there's we see it constantly lately in the news of people who have delusions of grandeur or just delusions. <laughs> um, and if you're at the bleeding edge, you know how do you determine whether you're having delusions of grandeur or what you're going to do is really going to be revolutionary. You don't know until it's over. <laughs> so, um, you just have to deal with every day as it comes. You know, I, I have to say, I, especially in the earlier days, but pretty much, you know, you in the film mix, which is kind of the sound mix of the last step to make the film, and you're sitting there, and I have to say that practically every film, I would like sit there and say, oh, now I understand how to tell this story. <laughs> I got it all wrong. I really understand. So one time we were in, we used to make from very fancy places in New York. I walk outside the mixing studio, and there is Woody Allen sitting there with his girlfriend at the time, and I can't remember. And I said, why are you here? And well, we start to talk. And he looked very, I mean, he looked like he had lost his last friend. And he said, well, we're mixing this film for the sixth time. And I mean, this is a very expensive process. It costs thousands, tens of thousands of dollars. Because he said, I just know that I, I just got it all wrong. So if Woody Allen can feel that way, then, you know, and his films will be big successes, then, you know, I, I felt that every time. But, you know, you believe in yourself, and after a while it goes on the air, and the world does not fall apart. Everything is fine the next day. The sun still comes up. And guess what? Some people even liked it. And once in a while, it will even win an Emmy. A film that you thought was actually pretty horrible. <laughs> so, 
you have to have, you have to believe in yourself and put one foot in front of the other and understand that you are gonna have bad feelings about the work. That's what drives you to do better is those bad feelings. They're not necessarily your enemy, so long as you can get on top of them. That's my two cents of advice. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm Travis, I'm a graduate student in the history department. Uh, so the co-creator of uh, CRISPR Cas9, Jennifer Doudna, often likens her research and discovery to this giant wave that she doesn't control or doesn't have any idea how people are going to use it. How do you grapple with some of the socioeconomic uh, implications of modern biotechnology and like where that may go from what you want to do with it? No, it's a, it's a great question and uh, it, it, it's, there's lots of different complex answers to it, but um, first and foremost, you have to believe in your colleagues and the community um, that they're not going to take this new very powerful technology and do evil things with it. Um, and so far that's been the case. At the same time when we made an instrument that automatically printed uh, DNA sequences, uh, I guess we didn't totally trust everybody, uh, so we built in uh, security measures so that somebody couldn't make smallpox or some other infectious agent with it. Um, and so I guess I had faith and belief, but uh, um, kept a loaded gun in case. <laughs> um, so, it, you know, that's why there's this whole field of dual-use technology. And they act, you know, people act like this is something new. You know, you can build a home with a hammer or you can hit somebody on the head with it. There's, there's been dual-use technology around forever. But there hasn't been things as powerful as what can be done with magnification from, you know, CRISPR or other things. You know, the potential for misuse, and you know, Jennifer's right in the sense that uh, the CRISPR use expanded, you know, out of her hands almost instantaneously and there's nothing that she could do to influence that. Uh, with synthetic biology, it's a little bit more complicated because it took a higher uh, skill set for people to use it and more resources. And, you know, there's a reason that nobody else has made a synthetic organism yet. It's, it's really hard and took a very dedicated team a decade to do it. But uh, if, if it was trivial or it becomes trivial, you know, um, people do all kinds of horrible things in our society and I would not want to, you know, leave it up to somebody who wants to do a lark of making smallpox, you know, because they don't like their neighbors. Um, so it's something that we have to be aware of, but probably the most important thing is, as everybody's just experienced for the last several years, new emerging infections are a far greater threat than any man-made pathogen could be. Um, and, but the solution is the same for both. It's having a great arsenal of antivirals, of detection technologies, of antibiotics, uh, and we will all face the next few decades, far more new emerging infections than anybody could conjure up in their most science fiction uh, mind of uh, evildoers. Uh, I just want to thank all of the students uh, for coming out. 
I promise this will happen because it always happens to me. From now on, you don't realize how many times you've heard the names of Craig and Paula, and now you'll hear them and you'll say, oh man, I met her. Or, dude, I saw that dude give a talk, right? Um, and for that, Craig and Paula, I want to thank you uh, for giving us this experience today. I really appreciate it. We all do. What he's saying is we're going to appear in your sleep and your nightmares. <laughs> when, when the world ends because of the synthetic, well, no, we met that. Um, uh, just a plug for this evening. Uh, also, we're having a similar question and answer period uh, tonight at the Ellen Theater uh, for the Bozeman community. That's open uh, for everyone, including students, but also the general public from five to seven. Um, and you'll also be seeing a video, if you made it uh, tonight, uh, by Steve Wozniak, who I'm not sure who that is, <laughs> um, the co-inventor of Apple. And so a another a great experience that you could have because none of you have anything better to do on a Friday night. Um, again, one more round of applause uh, for our distinguished <laughs>